Lesson 13 for June 20 to 26, Living by the Word of God. Read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 20. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this series of lessons about your Word and what it means to us, what it means to you, and how we can relate to you through it and how we can understand it so much better. We pray that not only may we understand and learn, but we may apply your word in our daily lives and be doers of your word. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is James chapter 1 and verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Let's read that again, James 1.22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The best method of studying the Bible is of no use if we are not determined to live by what we learn from Scripture. What is true for education in general also is true for studying the Bible in particular. You learn best not just by reading or hearing, but by practicing what you know. This obedience opens a full treasure house of divine blessings that otherwise would be closed to us, and it leads us on an exciting and life-transforming way to increase our understanding and knowledge. If we are not willing to abide by the Word of God, and are not willing to practice what we have studied, we will not grow, and our witness will be impaired because our life is out of harmony with our words. We grow in grace and wisdom through inspiring models who illustrate to us what it means to live by the Word of God. There is no better example and no motivational force more powerful than Jesus Christ. He gave us a pattern to follow. He lived a life in full harmony with the will of God. This week, we will study what it means to live by the Word of God and under its divine authority. Sunday, June 21, The Living Word of God and the Holy Spirit To study the Word of God carefully and with proper method is very important, but just as important, perhaps even more so, is that we put into practice what we have learned. The ultimate goal of studying the Bible lies not in acquiring greater knowledge, as wonderful as that can be. The goal is not about our mastering of the Word of God, but about the Word of God mastering us, changing our lives and our way of thinking. That is what really matters. To be willing to live the truth that we have learned means to be willing to submit to that biblical truth. This choice sometimes involves an intense struggle because we are fighting a battle over who will have the supremacy in our thinking and in our life. And, in the end, there are only two sides from which to pick. Question, read Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. What are these verses saying about how we should live? Philippians 2, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have also obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or laboured in vain. Yes, God works in us, but he does so through the Holy Spirit, who alone gives us the wisdom to understand the Holy Scriptures. Furthermore, as sinful human beings, we often are opposed to God's truth and left to our own devices. We would not obey the word of God. As we read in Romans 1 verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, 
who is blessed forever. Amen. And Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no affection for God's message. There is no hope, no trust, no love in response. Through the Holy Spirit, God indeed, as it says in Philippians 2.13, works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. The Holy Spirit is a teacher who desires to lead us into a deeper understanding of Scripture and to a joyful appreciation of the Word of God. He brings the truth of God's word to our attention and gives us fresh insights into those truths so that our lives are characterized by faithfulness and a loving obedience to the will of God. Ellen White writes in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 411, No one is able to explain the scriptures without the aid of the Holy Spirit. But... When you take up the word of God with a humble, teachable heart, the angels of God will be by your side to impress you with evidences of the truth. End of quote. In this way, spiritual things are interpreted spiritually. As we read in 1 Corinthians two thirteen and 14, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And we are able joyfully to follow God's word morning by morning, as it says in Isaiah 50 verses 4 and 5. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak. A word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. And so to finish the day, Philippians 2.16 says that we should hold fast the word of life. What do you think that means? And how do we do that? See also Deuteronomy 4.4, which teaches something similar. What is our role in this whole process? Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 4. But you who hold fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Monday, June 22. Learning from Jesus. There is no better and more inspiring example to follow than Jesus Christ. He was familiar with the Scriptures and was willing to follow the written Word of God and abide by it. Question. Read Luke chapter 4, verse 4, 8, 10, 11, and 12. How does Jesus use Scripture to counter Satan's temptations? What does this tell us about how central the Scriptures must be to our faith, especially in times of temptation? Luke chapter 4, verse 4, But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And verse 8, And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And verse 10, For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus knew the scriptures well. He was so intimately familiar with the word of God that he could quote it by heart. This familiarity with God's written word must have resulted from precious quality time with God in studying the scriptures. 
If he had not known the exact words of Scripture and the context in which they appear, he could easily have been deceived by the devil. Even the devil quoted Scripture and used it for his own deceptive purposes. Thus, just being able to quote Scripture as the devil did is not enough. One also needs to know what else Scripture has to say on a subject and know its correct meaning. Only such familiarity with God's Word will help us, like Jesus, not to be fooled by God's adversary, but to be able to resist the attacks of Satan. Time and again we read about Jesus opening the minds of his followers to understand Scripture by referring to them to what is written. And we find that in Luke 24, verses 45 and 46. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And Matthew 11, verse 10, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. And John 6, verse 45, It is written in the prophets, And they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. He assumed that those who read the Scriptures can come to a correct understanding of its meaning. Luke 10.26 What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? For Jesus, what was written in the Scripture is the norm that we should live by. In John 7.38, Jesus, the Word of God made flesh, referred his followers back to what Scripture said. Let's read that. John 7.38, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It is only through the Bible that we know that Jesus is the promised Messiah. It is the scriptures that testify about him, as we read in John 5.39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Jesus himself was willing to abide by the scriptures, the word of God committed to writing. If he was willing to do that, what does this tell us about what we should do as well? And so to finish the day. What has been your own experience with using the scriptures in your battle with temptation? That is, when tempted, did you start reading the Bible or quote scripture? What happened as a result and what have you learned from that experience? Tuesday, June 23. Jesus versus Scripture? Question. Read John chapter 5, verses 45 to 47. What powerful message does Jesus give us here about his relationship to the Bible? John 5, beginning at verse 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me... But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Some people claim that when Jesus spoke, he put his words in stark contrast to the words of Scripture, as we find them in the Old Testament. They say that the words of Jesus are even elevated above the words of Scripture. In the New Testament, we read that Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, And this happens in Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44. Let's read the whole two verses. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And he also did this in the same chapter, Verses 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger 
of hell fire. And verses 27 and 28, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And verses 33 and 34, again you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And verses 38 and 39, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one to him also. When Jesus said these famous words in the Sermon on the Mount, he was not trying to abandon or abolish the Old Testament, as some interpreters claim. Instead, he responded to various interpretations of Scripture and to oral traditions that were used by some interpreters of his day to justify behaviour toward other people that God did not condone and never commanded. Like hating your enemy, as... We read in verse 43, Jesus did not abolish the Old Testament in any way or in any degree lessen its authority. The opposite is true. It was the Old Testament that indeed proves who he is. Indeed, he intensified the meaning of the Old Testament statements by pointing us to God's original intentions. To use Jesus' authority to disqualify Holy Scripture or to denigrate some parts of the Bible as uninspired is perhaps one of the subtlest and yet most dangerous criticisms of Scripture because it is done in the very name of Jesus. We have Jesus' example of how much authority he gave to the Scriptures which in his day consisted of the Old Testament only. What more evidence do we need about how we should view the Old Testament as well? Far from weakening the authority of Scripture, Jesus consistently upheld Scripture as a reliable and trustworthy guide. In fact, he unambiguously states in the very same Sermon on the Mount, in verse 17 of chapter 5, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfil. And he continues to say that whoever, in two verses later, verse 19, annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So to finish today, what are some of the key doctrines that, to this day, find their grounding in the Old Testament? Think, for example, of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, and the fall in Genesis 3. What other crucial Christian truths do we find in the Old Testament that are later amplified in the New Testament? Wednesday, June 24. Quiet Times with the Word of God Our lives tend to be hectic and filled with tension and stress. Sometimes we have to work hard just to get by, to survive and to put food on the table. Other times, even when we have the necessities of life, we hustle and bustle because we want more and more. We want the things that we think will make us happy and fulfilled. But, as Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes warns us, that doesn't always happen. Whatever the reason, we can be terribly busy in our lives, and so it's very easy, amid the busyness, to crowd out God. It's not that we don't believe, but only that we don't spend quality time reading, praying, and drawing close to God, who has your breath in his hand, as it reads in Daniel 5 verse 23. We can be too diverted by other things to experience quality time with God. We all need moments in which we deliberately slow down to meet the one who is our Saviour, Jesus. 
How can the Holy Spirit speak to us if we do not pause to listen? The special quiet time with God in reading His Word and in the communication of prayer is the source of our spiritual life. Question, read Psalm 37, 4, Psalm 46, 10, and Psalm 62, verses 1, 2, and 5. What do these texts teach us about the quiet time with God? Why is quiet time with God so important? Psalm 37, 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. And Psalm 46, verse 10, Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And Psalm 62, verse 1, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. Verse 2, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defence. I shall not be greatly moved. And verse 5. My soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. If you love someone, you enjoy spending time alone with that beloved person. Choose a place in which you can read and reflect on God's Word without interruptions. In our hectic life, this can succeed only if you deliberately reserve a specific window of time for this encounter. Often the beginning of the day is best for these minutes of quietness and reflections. Such moments before the workday begins can become a blessing for the whole rest of the day because the valuable thoughts you gain will accompany you for many hours. But be creative to find the right quality time you need in order to meet with God without interruption. To be connected through prayer with the living God of the Bible affects your life as nothing else ever can. Eventually, it contributes to your becoming more like Jesus. So to finish the day, how deliberate are you in seeking time to spend alone with the Lord? What are those times like? And how do they help you to know even better the reality and love of God? Thursday, June 25, Memory and Song Psalm 119, verse 11 reads, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorizing scripture brings multiplied blessings. When we store precious passages of God's word in our minds, we can bring to life what has been committed to memory and apply it in new and changing circumstances. That way, the Bible directly impacts our thinking, our decisions, and influences our values and behavior. Memorizing Scripture brings the Bible to life in our daily experience. Furthermore, it helps us to worship God and to live a faithful life according to the Scriptures. To remember Scripture word by word is a tremendous safeguard against deceptions and false interpretations. Learning Scripture by heart enables us to cite Scripture even when we do not have a Bible available. This can become a tremendous power for good in situations when temptations arise or when we are faced with adverse challenges. To recall God's promises and to fix our minds on God's Word rather than on our problems lifts our thoughts to God, who has a thousand ways to help when we see none. Question. Read Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. How can singing God's word establish and strengthen the word of God in our minds? Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. 
Singing the words of the Bible also can be a powerful way to memorize the text of Scripture. In singing, the words of Scripture are more easily remembered. To combine the words of Scripture with beautiful melodies will anchor them in our thoughts more firmly and be an effective way to dispel our anxious moods. Scripture passages that are connected with simple but harmonious melodies can easily be sung and memorized by little children and adults alike. Scripture was the inspiration for numerous and world-famous oratorios, symphonies and other music that has shaped and influenced Christian culture throughout the centuries. Compositions that lift up our minds and direct our thoughts to God and His Word are a wonderful blessing and positive influence in our lives. And Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 594, Music forms a part of God's worship in the courts above, and we should endeavour in our songs of praise to approach as nearly as possible to the harmony of the heavenly choirs. Friday, June 26. We're asked to have a look at the chapter in Steps to Christ, The Privilege of Prayer, pages 93 to 104. If you have opportunity to do that, I would recommend that. Now, from the text written here in the pamphlet, Ellen White writes in the Upward Look, page 155, The natural eye can never behold the comeliness and beauty of Christ, the inward illumination of the Holy Spirit revealing to the soul its true hopeless, helpless condition, without the mercy and pardon of the sin-bearer, the all-sufficiency of Christ, can alone enable man to discern his infinite mercy, his immeasurable love, benevolence and glory. End of quote. And from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, April 8, 1884, portions of Scripture, even whole chapters, may be committed to memory, to be repeated when Satan comes in with his temptations. When Satan would lead the mind to dwell upon earthly and sensual things, he is most effectually resisted with, It is written. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, how does the reality of free will and free choice play into all our decisions regarding faith and obedience? Though many areas of our life are out of our control with regard to the crucial things, the things that pertain to the eternal life, we do have free choice. What are you doing with the free will that God has given you? What kind of spiritual choices are you making? Two, Think about the role that the Sabbath can and should play in terms of giving us quiet time with God. How does keeping the Sabbath protect you from being so caught up in working and doing things that you don't spend the time with God that you need to spend? How can you learn to make the Sabbath more of the spiritual blessing that it was meant to be? 3. What has been your experience in spending time with God alone in prayer and study? How does this spiritual practice impact your faith? How should it impact your faith? In class, if you feel comfortable, talk about your own personal times of reading and praying and what you have gained from them. How might others benefit from what you have learned? 4. What are some of your favourite texts that you have memorised? What is it about them that you like so much? How has memorising them been a blessing to you? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Escape from a Plane Crash and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Pius Kabadi Chiaombi, 
A 53-year-old lay evangelist boarded the AN2 single-engine biplane for a flight to visit a church that he planted in a remote region of the Democratic Republic of Congo. But the Soviet-built plane, operated by Kinshasa-based Air Kasai, developed engine trouble shortly after taking off from Kamako for the 90-mile or 150-kilometre flight to Shikapa, located near the border with Angola. As the pilot looked for a place to land, the plane lost altitude and smoke filled the cabin. Chombi saw the pilot emerge from the cockpit. Follow the pilot, a voice seemed to say. Chombi sprang to his feet. The pilot opened an exit and jumped out. Chombi also jumped. Moments later, the AN-2 slammed into the bush and burst into flames. The crash occurred about two miles or three kilometres from the Kamako airport on July 27, 2018. Only Chombi and the pilot survived, and the other five passengers died. He survived with only his cell phone, said Chombi's wife, Nicole, who received a confirmation about her husband's condition via WhatsApp photographs sent by a friend after the crash. He had a head and leg wound, but no broken bones. Among the photos is one of Shombi dazed and wearing a blood-soaked shirt with a cell phone in his hand. Nicole was able to speak with her husband for three days, but his first words by phone were filled with praise to God. I will never leave this God, he told her. He is wonderful. Chiombi had wanted to visit a small church plant of 15 people that he opened after evangelistic meetings in Kabungyu. But he ended up on the AN2 on a Friday after learning that his desired flight left on Saturday. They told him that he would have to travel on Sabbath, his wife said. He said, I can't because I worship on Sabbath. But they said, the flight only goes on Saturday. He said, I'll find another way to reach my destination. Chiombi, pictured below, second from left, called his wife from the airport to announce his changes in plan. He hoped to find a new way to connect to Kabungyu. Nicole has many questions about what happened. She doesn't understand why only Chombi and the pilot survived. She doesn't know whether Chombi's decision to keep the Sabbath played a role in the story, but she believes that he was delivered as promised in Psalm 91 verse 14, where the Lord says, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Be faithful to God, because he can protect us at all times, she said. Part of the 2019-13 Sabbath offering helped expand the Adventist Clinic in Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering this Sabbath, which will help spread the gospel in the Trans-European Division. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.